we're going to finish up chapter one today. <laughs> By that, I mean we're going to finish up talking about parallel perpendicular lines, how to solve them, how to find them, and then we're going to look at inequalities. What they are, how to solve them in an equation. So let's review. Equations of lines. There are four different types of things that happen when you have two lines. What do we call this pair this type of lines? Parallel. The symbol we use is just those two hash marks. What do we call these two lines? Perpendicular, very good. And you know they're perpendicular because you have this little symbol here, which means what? Yeah, it means they're 90 degree angles to each other. They're orthogonal to each other. How about these lines? Yes, those are in your notes. And the last one, anything else? How many solutions do parallel lines have? No solutions. Why not? Why don't they have any solutions? When we talk about solutions of, of two lines, what are we talking about? Well, let's... How many solutions does this one have, perpendicular? Why does this one have one solution and this one has no solutions? Why is that? What is a solution? No, it's, it's like an intercept, but we have two lines here. How many solutions does this one have? Why is that? Why does this one have infinite solutions? And this one has none, and this one only has one. Yes, I'm, I'm making this class easy for you all, so you don't have to do too much work. But you do have to learn something out of this class. Because if you progress to another class and you can't do anything in math, do not blame me. Do not blame me. So I'm giving you all the tools. Whether you choose to learn them or not, that's up to you. You're going to have to know them eventually. If you're going to get your bachelor's, you're going to have to know algebra for your upper level courses. And if you fail that miserably, do not blame me. These are in your notes. We talked about these last week. And yet, only one person, two people are answering these questions. But all they're doing is reading their notes. They're not telling me, answering the questions. They're reading the notes. I can do that. I want to know what you know not what you can read. Nope. Nope. 
what is a solution? And when you have two lines, what does a solution represent? The what? What point? Did I make all the tests taken in the testing center now then? Where you have to know the stuff and not be able to cheat your way through it? Because clearly nobody's taking this class too seriously. There are six brains in here. At least you put them together, look at your notes, look what you wrote last week, try to figure something out here. For this one? Yes. I mean, yeah, obviously, if this only has one solution, this one has no solutions, this one has infinite many, yes, it's where the lines cross. That's the solution when you have two lines. That should be in your notes. That should be what you study over the weekend. I'm really, really, really thinking about making all the tests in the testing center now. No notes, no anything. I'm going to force you to learn this one way or the other because you're not doing anything right now. Yeah, solution is how many times the lines cross. It, every point on the same lines are solutions because they overlap. Find the equation of the line, the EOL. Parallel to the line. And going through the point negative one, three. So we need a slope and a point. We have the point. We have an equation of a line. Our line has to be parallel to it. So how do we find the slope of this line? How do we find the slope of this line? Hmm? Nope. Subtract what? What are you trying to get to? You're right. What are you trying to get to? Very good. We want to put it into this form. What is that form called? What is M? What is B? So it's a slope intercept form. So we solve for Y. We add three X to both sides. Y 
and then we divide by two. So what's our slope? Right. Our slope is since it's parallel, it's equal to it since they're par since they are parallel. Okay, we have a slope and we have a point. What do we do from there? What's that called? Very good. You drop a piece of paper. So plug that information into the point slope formula, which is y minus y1, x minus x1. Can you close the door, please? Can you close the door? Please. Thank you. So we have a point, we have a slope. Where do these guys go into? X1, Y1. So it's y minus 3, m is 3 over 2, x minus negative 1. Can we do anything before first before we do anything else? What, what does order of operation tell us to do? Parentheses. Can we do anything inside the parentheses? Yeah, negative times negative is a what? You can only have one sign between two numbers. Negative times negative is a positive. Steps continued. Step three. What do we do here? You can, but the, yeah, that wouldn't be wrong. You would have a lot of fractions though. Rule of thumb is if you have fractions and the equal sign, get rid of the fractions because Again, the less you have to write, the less chance of mistake you'll have. Fractions inherently require two extra steps to write the number. So how do we get rid of the fractions? What are the five steps? Very good. What is what is the LCD in this case? <laughs> Very good. All right. It's the only denominator. There's only one fraction. It's the only denominator. And if we had multiple of them, then we'd just multiply them together, and that'll be the lowest we have. We'll fix that at the end. What do we do with the LCD? Multiply each term 
by the LCD. Very good. How many terms do we have? Yeah, this is a term, this is a term, and this whole thing is a term. Remember, a term is anything separated by plus, minus, or equals. So basically, all we do is put the two, the LCD, in front of each term. So all I did, I multiplied the LCD to each term. I just basically just put it in front of each term. Step three. Very good, very good, good memorized. Reduce, whenever you're multiplying fractions, before you multiply fractions, always reduce. Can anything on the bottom cancel anything on top? So the only fraction we have is here. How many times does two go into two? Once, so it's gone. So this is what we have. There's nothing out in front, so we have three X plus one. The fourth step. Excellent. Multiply to remove the parentheses, which is the whole purpose of this. We have to get rid of the fractions and get rid of the parentheses. So two times y is two y. Negative times positive is negative. Two times three is six. Three times x is three x. Positive times positive. Three times one. And the last step. Solve. In this case, we're solving for y. Very good. You didn't even look at your notes there. That's excellent. I'm proud of you. So we have to get y by itself. What do you have, have to get rid of first? Negative six, yeah. Get rid of anything plus or minus first. So how do we get rid of negative six? Only to the like terms. Six is canceled, so we have 2y equals 3x plus 3 plus 6 is 9. The last step, divide each term by 2. This is the equation of the line parallel to that. And that's the answer. That's the equation of the line parallel to this equation going through the point negative one, three. Pretty straightforward. If you know the steps, yes, it's pretty straight. It's it's all step by step by step. There's nothing we can change. All right, let's do another one. Okay. 
find the equation of the line perpendicular to the line four y minus three x equals twelve. Going through zero five. So the first thing you have to do is Yeah, we have to solve this one for y. Why is that? Why do we have to do that? Well, we have to find the slope because our slope of our line has to be perpendicular to this one. So we have to start with this one and find its slope. Basically, we have to solve for y. Add 3x to both sides. and then divide by four. So that is this line. What is the slope of that line? We need to have the slope perpendicular. So what is the perpendicular slope? What are the conditions for a perpendicular slope? Change signs and flip. I mean, if you didn't know that, then whatever you're writing past that is thrown away. It's wrong. So what's our slope going to be? Negative. It has to be different signs, and we flip this one. So it's 4 over 3. So this is our slope, and our point is zero five. So we have all the information we need to find an equation. We have everything we need. Plug the information inside there. Y minus five. Negative four thirds x minus zero. Inside the parentheses, we can fix that. X minus zero is just x. And in this one, we don't have to do any changing of the fractions because there is no need to. We only have one coefficient in front of x. So get the y by itself. And there's our 
our equation of the line perpendicular to 4y minus 3x equals 12. Going through the point zero 0.05. That's our answer. Let's review also. This is example three. Find the equation of the line parallel and perpendicular equation of the lines parallel. to the line y equals 3x plus 2 and going through the point 4, negative 4. Actually, hold it for this. Let's get rid of that part. Make it the line equals y equals two. Make it easier for you. Find the equation of the lines parallel and perpendicular to the line y equals two, and going through the point four negative four. Find the equation of the line of slope zero going through the point five, negative five. Find the equation of the line undefined slope going through the point one half, negative three fifths. So what do we know about the first equation? What's the slope? The slope is zero. What does the slope zero look like? It's a horizontal line. So if it's a horizontal line, what's the equation of the line? It's in your notes. I just wrote them up there. That's the equation of the line with slope zero. Since it's horizontal, there is no x value. So it's y equals negative five. Conversely, if we have an undefined slope, that means it's going up and down. So our slope is only the x value. That's, that's what, again, it's simple concepts, but you have to put it together. All right, let's move on. Inequalities. Do not have simply one solution. They have solution sets. Solution sets are written inside D 
these squiggly lines. This is what represents a set. So if I give you that inequality, what would you put inside? What's my solution? What goes inside my set? What numbers? What integers? Hmm? How would you read this? Three is less than X is less than or equal to seven. So that means X is bigger than three, but it's less than or equal to seven. What numbers does that include? Four, what else? We cannot start with three because there's no equal sign. And we have to include seven because it is equal. So that's that's my answer. That's my solution set. What's my answer here? What's my solution set? These are the same thing. This is interval notation. This is set notation. This is interval notation. Or we could look at it graphically. These are my x's. They all mean the same thing. I want all the numbers between 3 and 7, including 7. This is a graphic notation. As you can tell, as you can tell, each notation has its own language. Set notation uses less than, greater than, less than, equal to, greater than, equal to, equal, not equal to. And those are the symbols for set notation. Why is this one called less than, this one's greater than? Exactly. Because when we read these things, 
This one says three is less than X. What's another way of saying this? This is the same thing as saying X is greater than three. If you flip them around, you have to make sure that the arrow is pointing to the same number. You can't just change the X in the number. You have to change the whole thing. Take your paper and just flip it over. Interval notation. Uses parentheses and brackets. The parentheses say the end number is not included in your answer. And the bracket says the end number is included. So if you have parentheses, a comma b, a comma b. Well, what is what do a and b represent? Smallest number in the set, the largest number in the set. And it's always left to right, so it's always getting but larger. And the graphic notation uses open circles and closed circles. Open circle is not included. And the closed circle is, it is included. Let's just see what, what I mean by these. Well, up here, we just, talked about, we just talked about these. The inequality goes with the parenthesis. The, it has an equal sign. It goes with the bracket. So the equal, if it has an equal sign on the bottom or it's a bracket, on the graph, it's a solid dot. Conversely, if I have a solid dot, that means it's a bracket. Or the inequality has a line underneath it. So far, so good. Pull out your inequality tables that I gave you last week. If you don't have one, if you have a few extra. Yeah. Let's look at this one. Typically, whenever you're asked to convert from one measurement to another, it's always easiest if you go from the graphing. For the first one, 
when I graph the shade this region, these are my X's. So the set notation, what it tells me is my X, since it's to the left, is less than or equal to some number A. That's the number of start. It's, remember, you read left to right, negative infinity to A. So it's less than A. The interval notation, you only look at the endpoints. Our endpoint is negative infinity. That's the smallest, and it stops at A. Can you ever include infinity? No, we can never get to it. So infinity is always a parenthesis. Because we can never get to it. And since A is a solid dot, we use a bracket. Those all three mean the same. The other direction. We're saying here that X is greater than or equal to A. Because it's to the right. So what are my endpoints? A and infinity. You can never get to infinity, so it's a parenthesis. A is a solid dot, so it's a bracket. Number three. It starts at A, but it doesn't really start at A because it's an open circle. So X is strictly less than A. I cannot use A in my data set. The interval notation, you look at the endpoints, negative infinity and A, so I'll put those down. I can never get to negative infinity and I cannot use A, so it's parenthesis, parenthesis. And for the, the fourth one here, or third one here, no, it's fourth. So X is strictly greater than A, since it's going to the right. If it's going to the left, it's, it's less than. If it's going to the right, it's greater than. So the interval notation, look at the endpoints. I have A and infinity. I can never get to infinity, and since A is open, I use that. So that's only going one direction. Now we're looking at a finite set. It's between two numbers. We're looking at all of these here. It's going to be between A and B. So in the first one, X is between A and B. So in other words, X is larger than or equal to A or less than equal to B. It could be anywhere between there. The interval notation just takes the smallest and the largest. And if it's a solid, it's a bracket. If it's an open, it's a parenthesis. Again, what this thing says is A is less than or equal to X, which is strictly less than B, because I can't use it. So I'm going from A to B. And B, since it's open, it's a parenthesis.
So I have a, I cannot use a, so it's just strictly greater than, or x is greater than, and I can use b. So it's a inequality. I look at the beginning and the end points. That's a parenthesis and that's a bracket. So here we have again, A is strictly less than X, which is strictly less than B. They're both open and it goes from A to B. Pretty easy. Don't let that fool you because a lot of mistakes happen here because of that. Now we're going the opposite directions. We're going starting from a point and going the opposite directions. So look at this first one. What does this one tell us? It tells us that X is less than or equal to A. And it's also telling us that X is greater than or equal to B. Because if I'm thinking of a number that could be in here or in here, both of these are correct answers. And that's why if I have bi-directional, then I have to have the word or for the set notation. The answer is going to be in here or it's going to be in here. The interval notation. Look where you, the lowest you can get and the highest. So we go from negative infinity to A, parentheses, bracket, and then bracket B, comma, to where it ends. Here I use the letter U for union. Whenever you deal with interval notation, you deal with unions. The union symbol stands for OR. but we have to use the union symbol. Okay, since we're looking at infinite, so I have my x's are here and here. So x is less than or equal to a, since a is a solid dot, or x is strictly larger than b. The interval notation, go from the endpoints, negative infinity, comma, A, bracket, union with, B is open, so it's parenthesis, and infinity is also open. X is strictly less than A, or X is larger than or equal to B. That's what that one says. Negative infinity to A, and they're both parentheses. B is a solid, so it's a bracket. I'm a so again, the interval notations, you start and stop. And lastly, for this set, X is strictly less than A, or X is strictly greater than B. Negative infinity to A, and B to positive infinity. So far so good? Now, the last three are the most difficult ones. How do I represent a point? Hmm. 
Hmm? In set notation? Exactly. That's a point. Or if we wanted to, which would be ridiculous, extra writing, we'd say A is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to A. But this makes it much easier to write. How would I put it in interval notation? What symbol says we can use it? Bracket or parenthesis? Bracket. So this one would be bracket A. The not a point, if it's not that, that means it has to be everything else. So here, x is not equal to a. And in interval notation, it's parentheses a. And the last one, it's everything. These are all my x's. We would write the real number system, R, with that big old fat side. And for interval notation, we'd put simply put negative infinity to positive infinity. All this, all these are equal. So far, so good. So those are the symbols. Then I'll let you guys go. And to next class, we're going to do examples of these. Because we have certain specific types of equations we can do these. And for example, like this. How would you solve it? Treat that as an equal sign, the same way. So what do you have to get rid of first to solve for x? Yeah, so we subtract two from both sides. Five minus two is three. And then we divide by three. So x is equal is less than one. X is less than one. Is that an open or closed circle? An open circle. Which direction does the arrow, the shady region go? Why to the left? Right. So that's, this is the set notation. This is the graphic notation. How would I put this in the intervals? Yeah, start with the lowest, comma, the highest. You can never get to infinity, and we can't use that, so it's parentheses. And you notice, with, with set and interval notations, we don't have one number. We have a whole series of numbers. It's a set of numbers. So this is what we'll do next time. You treat them like you do an equal sign, but there are some stipulations depending on what you have. And we'll talk about that next time.